Lord, it is good for us to be here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sometimes, I think, we need something spectacular to set us free from sadness. True, ours is a religion of goal, and it's of joy. Its goal is glory. And yet, there is the weight of responsibility. The Ten Commandments can weigh heavy on any back. And a kind of a weariness from the continued doing of good. And of course, a worry about the future. Perhaps this is where Peter, James, and John were, the chosen three of the apostles. Our Lord stopped with them at Mount Faber on his way to Jerusalem, and their destination was outside the holy city, Calvary. Our Lord had already predicted his death, and they did not understand it. But what they knew is that between our Lord and the leaders of the Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees, there was a coming conflict which could only end in collision. The crucifixion would be their response of rejection to the whole of this divine plan. God becomes a man so that by sanctifying grace we may share in his divinity set up on this earth a society where Christ is king so as to help us save our souls. And then one day, all of us go to the light of heavenly glory. But his people, who were chosen from the beginning to be the carriers of this plan to all mankind, had their own plan, not a supernatural, but a natural one, a man or as the Jews say today, a nation, their own, as the Messiah, which they assure us will bring happiness by the imposition of Jewish domination over all of the earth. For them and for our Lord, it is an either-or proposition, and someone is going to die. The apostles sense this. Read the scriptures. The pages of the Bible crackle with the tension of this inevitable conflagration that will come in time there at, at Calvary. So the apostles are a little weary They're wondering all these big things, as you and I do still today. That hasn't changed. What did our Lord do for them, though? He gives them a glimpse of glory. For a second, they see him as he is, transfigured before them. They're dazzled with the light. St. Mark says in the Greek, that that light was like light that reflects off of pure gold or the ray of the sun directly, as if that were not enough. As they look wondering, they see their two great prophets, the good leaders of the Jews of old whom God had sent to prepare them for this hour and day, Moses and Elias, talking about our Lord's death. They're there, so much as if to say, it's meant to be, you see. And finally, 
comes a cloud to overshadow all of them. And a voice out of the cloud, the majesty of God. This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. And then, in a moment, it is done. And there stands only the man, God, Jesus Christ, in his human appearance. Tell the vision, he says, to no man, till the Son of Man be risen from the dead. And they go down from the mountain and head towards Jerusalem. They will never forget what they see and hear that day. Oh, they will, as you and I, still grow sad. At Gethsemane, they will fall asleep out of grief. But even when Peter denies and James disappears and leaves his brother John alone next to Jesus to receive the Blessed Mother as his own on Good Friday, even then they will never forget what they have seen and heard that day. St. Peter writes about it later, today's epistle. An absolutely reliable prophetic message. And you, he writes to us, you would do well to pay attention to it. It's a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Now, how does our light come so that you and I could stop in our weary journey full of worry and be refreshed and exclaim, it is good for us to be here. We're not here under constraint or force. It is good for us to be here. Very often, for us, it will be in some sacramental way, perhaps a magnificent mass that touches us, a beautiful exposition of the blessed sacrament that draws us into prayer, or even one devout Holy Communion. This week we have the feast of the Curie of Ars, his statue is there halfway down the church. St. Jean-Marie Vianney, patron of parish priests. He grew up after the French Revolution, and his parents had to stop going to church, you know. It was still the Latin Mass, but it was a Latin Mass offered in union with the revolutionary new church. And his parents were just farmers, but they knew better. And they waited for the priest to come to them. He made his first communion the way some of you, I think, made yours. At an altar set up in his kitchen, in the family kitchen. And after he received our Lord, he wrote later, he was in such wonderful prayer that he didn't want to leave the room. But his mother needed to fix breakfast for the priest. And so eventually he had to stop his prayer. But he never forgot that moment of his first communion. Just an example of what our Lord does for each one of us so that the light, the star, will dawn in our own darkness. In this gospel, it's just starting to dawn upon the apostles the darkness, the scandal of the cross, what's going to happen. And for you and for me, perhaps, it's just starting to dawn upon us what's going to happen. And our tendency like theirs is to shake our head as though we had awakened from a dream and to say, no, this is the day, it's not that way. 
But it is the Holy Mass, the Church of our youth, the sacrifice which gives it its joy. They're all gone. They've been taken away. And Masses have to be offered in churches we build ourselves or in kitchens. The whole of the structure has been replaced with some newfangled, phony imitation. Flashy, yes, but false. A trick of lights and nothing more. The supernatural plan for man, which was intended to be given to the world through the nation of Israel, has been subverted by those who ought to have been its missionaries. And they tell us, shh, quiet about your religion. If you must believe it, have the decency to do so in private. Still today, the poor Jews know not the things that are to their peace. And they offer us naturalism. This world, and plenty of it, but for the next, don't worry about that. And our beloved country, a constitutional republic, whose one great glory before God surely has been this, that she has given freedom to the children of the light to realize the divine plan, Christians in the Catholic Church to live it in liberty. But now we are on our way, well on our way towards that one world government and one world church. And our leaders long ago have lost our respect. And far from inspiring us, I think they inspire our fear today. And we wonder, what will they decide to do against us? Next, by some clever ruse, reason has been replaced by feeling, and facts are meant to give way to sentimentality, as though there were no objective truth out there. Example, those who victimize us, who rejected our Lord, and have worked against him from the beginning, now claim for themselves a special victim state. Everything is turned around, and every piece of news or event has to be served up in order to strengthen their own propaganda and position. History, who really did start the modern wars, Shh, you're not allowed to talk about that. The changes in the Mass and in Catholic theology, silence, current events, the brutal and racist state of Israel, how Almighty God in today's Gospel predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the driving out of the Jews as a punishment for having killed the Son of God. But now they have come back and have driven out the Palestinians. And somehow we expect that ever there would be peace until these great issues are addressed. And they say it's anti-Semitism to know history or to speak the truth. The Catholic Church does not teach hatred. We pray devoutly and love in a very special way those who persecute our Lord the most. But if we did not say the truth, the very rocks would cry out. The scandal of the cross comes to cast its shadow always on our life. And you can flee into the unearthly light of a television set if you must, to try to get your light and wisdom. But it's a false light, flashy and nothing more. You won't get it from TV talk shows or from chat rooms 
and all of the rest. I think you would get it through a good rosary or two, some of you who neglect it. And did you ever think of reading? There is one book that ought to be in every Catholic home, and it's this one, Father Fahey. He's written several. If you want to know who started the wars, where this all came from, where our Lord's plan is and what it is, read Father Fahey, and you'll understand the whole of the scriptures, and you'll be able to make sense out of the headlines. You and I have seen the light of faith, and we have this firm, utterly reliable, prophetic word of the gospel. We know that it is good for us to be here, don't we? Only it's good to hear it from time to time. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.